This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. I thought I was making a pretty reasonable statement and everyone jumped all over me. Mm -hmm. And it's because Mm -hmm. you were trying to talk about a point that wasn't actually related to what the person was talking about and didn't even realize it. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non monogamy then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi-Amory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about internet arguments. The internet has created some amazing possibilities. It's allowed people with shared interests from across the globe to connect with each other. However, it has also caused people to become more and more divided and able to dehumanize each other when we don't have to see a real human being reacting to the hurt that we're causing when we argue with them. Internet arguments, man. Can you imagine if we found a way to use them as fuel? We We would would solve the energy crisis. Every problem would be solved. We would need... (laughs) Yeah, it's like some... Form of solar energy. Yeah, we would yeah. need for nothing. Just harness yeah. all of the, the all of the rage. angst and the rage <laughs> yeah. and the frustration. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I was wondering why we were talking about this simply just because I know when I'm on the internet, if I see people going at it, I'm always like, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna engage. Even like if somebody called me out on something, I would probably just be like, Oh my god, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then like not do anything else but which is why? not i mean that's not a bad tactic to take but it's it's yeah. just not a tactic that i think a lot of people the majority of people do take right on the internet. Sure. yeah well i mean obviously gosh since the early 90s we've all experienced this in some form if you've been on the internet since its inception you have <laughs> witnessed to or or more likely participated in some kind of internet argument i think it became very clear very early on the nature of internet arguments being really like no holds barred and mm-hmm. always inevitably devolving into talking about Hitler or Nazis and like making comparisons um, right. between the two. But the thing is, I think now, you know, we see this a lot. I think we especially see it in a lot of like online polyamory or relationship focused communities that inevitably there's going to be conflict. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be arguments that fall along the spectrum of either being like, really horrible to like really good, interesting debates. But I think the important thing is that, you know, as we spend more and more of our time and our interaction online, it's just inevitable that we're going to come across some kind of online disagreement that we're going to participate in either willingly or unwillingly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that kind of what you're bringing up about those arguments happening within more intentional communities, whether it's, you know, polyamory groups or queer groups or something that's, that's already sort of a subset of people who probably have somewhat aligned values versus the types of arguments that you'll have in a more public forum, like just on Reddit or on YouTube or somewhere like that. 4chan, yeah. (laughs) That there's definitely like a, a pretty significant qualitative difference between the two, but I think that actually a lot of the same principles can apply in both sorts of spaces. Yeah. Um, which is which is what we do want to talk about today. Definitely. Um, yeah. This is something that we personally have spent a lot of time and energy on thinking about, both in terms of how we can create the best possible and like healthiest possible space within our uh, patron-only Facebook community, but also you know in how we conduct ourselves individually in just in the internets right. as a whole. <laughs> uh, and actually, funny little side story, I was actually in a study about online versus real life conversations when I was when? in middle school, maybe. What? Yeah, it was- Was uh, that when online like just started? <laughs> it had just <laughs> began mean, and they immediately began studying it and not, you were not there. Not quite, but sort of, yeah. So the, the study was, um, 
being conducted at the college where my dad worked. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I ended up being part of this study. And I think I made like $5 or something for doing it. (laughs) Wow, Uh, that's a ton back then. What, was it just like a survey? Well, yeah, so so, no, it wasn't a survey. It was an actual, like you had to go to the place and, and be part of the study. And what they did is they put you in a group. And I think my group was just three people, maybe four. They put you in a group and would tell you sort of like a little story or kind of a prompt for a debate. And they used, you know, stuff that I now know are kind of these questions that are used a lot for the purpose of debate, where Mm. they're questions that have been engineered specifically so that people can argue either side and be able to back it up and that, that it's not slanted toward one side very much or the other. Like one of the famous ones is, um, the question of there's a, a, a man whose wife is sick with this disease that there's a new like experimental cure for it mm-hmm. uh, that might cure it, but he's not sure. But the only way he could get it would be to steal it. Right. Okay. So it's one of those things where it's like, where do your values lie? And they really it... wanted a middle schooler's opinion on this. <laughs> well, so the point of it is not. It matters so much. The point of these is not obviously about the debate yeah, itself. Of it's, it's about how people conduct themselves and how, how they you communicate. Conduct... So what you did is you, you, you were in this small group in person and you'd get one of these prompts and you would discuss it. Like, why, why would you do this thing versus the other? Why do you think that's right or this is right? Whatever. And then with that same group of people, you would do a different discussion, but it was all online. Hmm. And you were even just like in rooms next to each other, but you were just typing. And the, the purpose of the study was to see if people would, again, to you, this, is, this dates the study, if they would flame more, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is the term used in the 90s to describe yeah. people like essentially Trolling? becoming aggressive online. Being like, aggressive, yeah. Yeah, being, being oh, more aggressive, being, being more like personally attacking mm-hmm. or whatever. So another reason why we're talking about all this is because the things that we are going to be discussing today can not only be used in internet arguments, but they can also be used in real life arguments, as in like face to face arguments. Not that like internet arguments aren't real life. I guess they are, but they're virtual real life. So maybe they don't count as much. It's a different dynamic for sure. I think we can all agree on that. That I, I think not seeing someone's face is yes. a big part yes. of it. I, I've yeah. Go ahead, Em. Well, no, just in a recent episode of the show Legion on FX, it's amazing, by the way. It's another, like, <laughs> fucking Marvel, like, X-Men show. Oh, I see. Um, but it's really good, and it, and it talked, actually, about, like, how uh, everybody nowadays is on their phones or online, and they interact with people that way as opposed to interacting in real life. So it makes them, like... It makes the people out there just like the other person or they're like a shadow of a person is how they put it. Mm -hmm. So they're not even real to us. Mm -hmm. And then when you actually like see someone in real life, it's a very different interaction. It's a very different thing. But it also like gives you the ability to feel as though you can just be a dick in a way that maybe you wouldn't be otherwise in real life. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there have been many studies and research papers and things written about how, you know, in moving to online interaction, we lose the like facial expressions and losing the emotions that we see in other people. And that's a big part of our conversation. And so we, our language has evolved to incorporate things like emoji and little JK and Mm -hmm. LOL and like little abbreviations that we can throw in there to, to get back a little bit of that like nuance a that we've of lost. The nuance. Yeah. A fraction of the nuance. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. also been shown even before that with uh, people in cars versus people, like if someone, um, you know, gets in front of you in line, the way you respond to that is very different from someone cutting you off in a right, car of because course, you're, you you're can't, seeing their face. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's why true. I swear so much in the car. Right. I'm like, fuck mm. you, fuck you. And I would never do that in real life. I would be like, oh, I'm sorry. You can, yes, you can go ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, really that's good true. Example. That's true. That is a good example. And it doesn't mean you never get mad in real life or you never have arguments in real life, but just it's, those problems are amplified online. Right, right. It's also really mm-hmm. easy for us to, because again, if there's this shadow of a person on the other side, it's also easy to do some transference as in mm. like we kind of, Build, build up that person in our mind. Like we kind of fill in the gaps mm. um, often to a degree of like filling in that this is like the worst possible person. And so it's justified for me to be really aggressive or really mm-hmm. dehumanizing is because in my brain I filled in 
that this person is just like this other asshole that I used to date, or this person is just mm. like my dad who I have unresolved issues with, you know, that, or just this archetype of a villain that we've right. been taught through like oversimplification <clears throat> of stories we're told in TV and movies and books and everything. Right. Right. Mm. So we're going to start out this episode today. Um, with the assumption that uh, trolling is not a part of this, like mm-hmm. trolling and people who are having a debate or having an argument purely for the sake of arguing or purely for the sake of trying to be inflammatory and trying to get it's people's like reactions, trouble. just causing trouble. Like we don't consider that within the realm of what we're talking about today. And so and mm-hmm. we do encourage you to, you know, kind of build that muscle of, of figuring, you know, being aware of that, of like when you're engaging with someone who's just kind of trolling or just kind of trying to poke at you versus when you're engaging with someone who is actually trying to discuss or have an argument or whatever. Right. And yeah. and both of those people could seem like jerks to you. Yes. But it's there's a subtle difference there of like whether they're actually trying to have a conversation or it's just trying to cause trouble. Right, right, definitely. And if they are just trying to cause trouble... Don't feed the trolls. Exactly. Exactly. What Jace always has to say to me. Yes. Um, (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. Sometimes. It's when I have to be like, no, no, no. Don't respond to that thing. Don't feed the trolls. We can fight about this later. Um, Anyway, so I think it's really interesting that if you start to do research on best practices for having discussions online or even having debates online, First of all, a lot of stuff comes up that's just like, well, it's super easy. Like, just be logical and be nice. You know, present your research and like, don't get emotional and, you know, be, don't be a sore loser and don't be a sore winner. And it's like, those sound like great easier said guidelines. Than done. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, and obviously so much easier said than done. But it all goes flying out the window, especially online when we can't see the person's face and especially when emotions are present. Um, and just because emotions are present doesn't mean that that it can be part of the discussion. And of course, you know, being logical, presenting facts, presenting research, it can sometimes be effective in certain contexts, but more often it does cause people to just kind of dig in their heels more, or it can encourage people to go into something like tone policing where it's like, well, you're not being logical enough. Like, you know, I can't talk to you unless you calm down or, or whatever, you know, even when emotions are maybe an important part of the conversation. Um, And I think the other thing is that a lot of the content out there sometimes goes into this realm of like, well, here's how you can win every argument or here's how you can never lose an argument. And I don't like that because it implies that every argument or disagreement can Mm. have a clear winner and loser. It also implies that that there should be a clear winner and loser. And I think that's where we tend to get really tripped up with a lot of this. That's that's more where I would go. It's just this idea that there should be a winner or that that's that that winning actually is good. Right, and we're right. going to get to that a little bit more actually in the second half of this episode of kind of evaluating what winning means. But uh, the way we're going to structure this episode is the first half of it is going to be about a little bit more internal work you can do for yourself. And then the second half is going to be more about some specific steps you can take and tools you can use in your online interactions. So <clears throat> this first part here is um, this, a, a lot of this was inspired by uh, something called the Quiet Ego Foundation. And what this is, is this... And by foundation, you mean like a philosophical foundation, not like an institute? No, I actually do mean an oh, institute. Oh, you do mean an institute? Yes. Oh, I had no idea. Oh. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, it's this is... It's, it's, not like, for... it's not like an institute exactly, but it's a, sort of a body of research that's being done right now, um, specifically about having a quieter ego and Mm. uh, we're going to get into what that means. Um, And uh, so essentially this is, this is uh, Heidi A. Wayment PhD and Jack J. Bauer PhD. And I just love the idea of Jack Bauer (laughs) doing research being like, tell me what I need to know, (laughs) like throwing people up against the wall. And they're like, Oh, my ego is not quite enough. (laughs) (laughs) This is what he did after 24. Yeah. Yeah, After the the events of 24. (laughs) <laughs> His like quiet retirement yeah. was, I'm just going to go into some like <laughs> ego and mindfulness based research, yeah. but old habits die hard. Yeah. So, so okay. this, this research is based on combining parts of Buddhist philosophy with research done in positive psychology, which we've talked about on this show before, um, as well as basic um, humanist psychological research principles. Um, and so the important thing I just want to preface here is that a quiet ego is not the same thing as a silent ego. A silent ego would be someone who has no sense of self at all, right? 
um, and mm-hmm. that a quiet ego is instead finding this balance between understanding that you're someone who exists in a world with other people and other beings. This also includes, you know, animals and whatever that that you're part of something larger, but then you are also an individual yourself. Mm-hmm. It's about finding the balance between those two things. Um, I also want to make the distinction too that having a quiet ego, and this has actually been researched. This isn't just sort of philosophical mumbo jumbo, but that having a quiet ego can promote better health. It can actually make you more likely to achieve your goals than sort of the type A aggressive way of going about it that we're taught, uh, at least in our Western culture. Um, And that having a quiet ego is not the same as being self-sacrificing all the time. Mm -hmm. And that actually being overly self-sacrificing is tied to more narcissistic tendencies in the research. Um, so I just want to make those couple little caveats, couple distinctions. So it doesn't mean just like being a doormat and like right, exactly. never getting into a discussion or anything like that. So in this research, they identified four um, overlapping principles and kind of interconnected kind of foundations. And so we're going to go through each of the four of those and talk a little bit about what those mean in general and then also how those can apply to how you interact online. So take us away with the first one. Okay, so the first part of having a quiet ego is, um, again, this very Buddhist sounding principle, uh, which is detached awareness. So I guess I take this to mean as this idea of having an attention to the present moment, having an awareness of the full spectrum of a situation. So being awareness of both the positives and the negatives of a situation, um, being detached from an ego driven evaluation of the present moment. So I think, you know, that's things like, immediately interpreting like, oh, this person's attacking me. Mm. This person's going after me. This person's making me look bad. Um, And I guess instead of kind of having a little bit more of an expansive view of what the situation is. I think that's where the detached part of the awareness comes from. Okay, yeah. So an awareness of like, this is what's going on, but like, I don't need to, my my first interpretation doesn't have to be about like, how does this affect me? And it's all about me, 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 me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And the last part being that, uh, someone with a quiet ego attempts to see reality as clearly as possible, whatever they may discover about themselves or others. So it's like really having a dedication to like trying to be as objective as possible, which is really difficult for us as human beings. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because you might not like what you find out. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, the next one is going to be to have an inclusive identity. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, What they're saying is that people whose egos are turned down in volume, uh, they have a balanced or more integrative interpretation of the self and others. So So tell us a little more about like what that looks like, how that, what that means. Yeah. So an example of what um, inclusive identity in a person can look like is that they do things like they understand other people's perspectives in a way that allows them to identify with like the experience of others so empathy i think is a good a good word to use there um if there are barriers up they work to break those barriers down Um, and they also have a deeper understanding of just like a common humanity and the people who they are having potentially like an argument with or or just a discussion with that they understand like there is a commonality between themselves and somebody else um and then also they're mindful so yeah this this word that is thrown around a lot these days <laughs> they are more mindful um and they are again more inclusive um especially in those moments where there's a lot of conflict going on uh where maybe their identity or their core values are challenged they still can have this inclusive understanding and this mindful understanding of what's going on um, and also, if your identity is inclusive, then you are more like, uh, likely to be a cooperative and compassionate person. Um, and you're not just only working to help yourself. Instead, you're working to help those around you as well. Yeah. So like that inclusive identity, meaning that you, your identity includes how you Others. fit in with all of humanity, mm-hmm. right? Like realizing yeah. this person you're arguing with 
like that you have a, a lot more in common with them. It's kind of like having your identity be part of the fact that we're all humans and kind of seeing yeah. the commonality between us. And I guess, yeah, I guess I think, kind of, oh, sorry, go ahead, Em. No, just, yeah, I think that so many people <coughs> tend, it tends to become like an, a me versus them or an us versus them thing. Yeah. And instead of being like, hey, there is pain here that is not separate from my pain. There is, you know, an understanding here that's not separate from mine. Um, I think, yeah, especially right now, I, th- I feel like the, the country is at such a divide and it is very like us versus them mm-hmm. sort of thing here in the United States and instead the, and of the trying internet makes to that work worse. together. Yeah. Oh my God. Can it, yeah. yeah. Jesus, like so many arguments and anger and like just p- people pissed off and name calling and all this stuff. And there is, it's just continuing to. Uh, make that divide even bigger instead right. of understanding, like this says, the commonality in us all. Right, that that we're in a place where we can live in these little echo chambers of just people who yeah. agree with us, and if we find someone who doesn't, we can block them. Right. Or, right, that we can sort of shut ourselves yeah. in this box of, like, they're others, they're hateable, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not related to them at all. Right. And so this inclusive identity is the opposite of that. But I think, yeah. you know, I just want to point out that it's not saying, like, we need to go into this, like, all kumbaya, like, we're all human <laughs> beings, and and so none of, like, none of our disagreements matter, you know, like, we don't oh, want no. to yeah. be eliminating the stories and lived experiences of people who, unfortunately, can't just kind of fall into the, like, oh, this commonality of humanity kind of thing. Um, but it's kind of like being able to maintain a sense of that, even when you're in disagreement with someone. Yeah, you know? definitely. No, yeah. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I don't didn't mean no, for no, us no, to give I that impression just, at yeah, all. I just no, wanted to, to, to make sure that that was, that was clear. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Right. It's just having that in mind when approaching these things. Right. Um, so yeah. then, then the third one here is called perspective taking. And this is um, basically just reflecting on the other viewpoints. It's um, a quiet ego, which brings attention outside of the self, increasing empathy and compassion. So definitely a lot of overlap with the others. But this, rather than being about how I identify myself and think about myself, it's about the just taking a perspective on the debate itself or on the things that are being discussed. Um, And a part of this is also that the realization of one's interdependence with others Mm -hmm. can actually lead to a greater understanding of the perspective of others. And this is something that's maybe for a a, a larger philosophical topic another time, but something that um, comes up a lot in conversations in in Buddhism, in in Buddhist teaching, is this idea that none of us are self-sustaining, none of us are self-sufficient, that we have this illusion, especially in Western culture, that we are, that we're totally self-sufficient, but you ignore the fact that you're interconnected to all of the people who built the place you live, who run the utilities that you use, who deliver your your packages on Amazon, who make the things that you're buying on Amazon, who make your food, who grow your food, like all these things, we are so interdependent upon each other that none of us truly are alone. You know, none of us exist entirely self-sustainingly. Sustain- it feels like I think you can say that. Sustainably? Okay. <laughs> Sustainably. Yeah. I feel like in Western culture too, there's this idea that we are supposed to be self-serving in a way or just right. sustainable i guess on our uh, by ourselves right or within like our small group of people that we are around every day and that's it and mm-hmm. instead of looking at the bigger picture of ourselves within like a larger community or even our country or our state or wherever yeah that like everyone is working towards common goals not just like ourselves right. being separate from everyone else mm-hmm. right right So the fourth one here is um, growth mindedness. So that means having a focus on development and change of yourself and of others over time. It means um, questioning the long-term impact of your actions in the moment. And I do love this part because I think that there's a lot of discussions online about intent versus impact of, for instance, someone's comments is usually Mm -hmm. the context that comes up within. Um, And, you know, you can say it till you're blue in the face, like, well, I didn't intend this, I didn't intend that, I didn't intend to hurt this person, I didn't intend to trigger this person, I didn't intend to do that. And, like, 
that is fine, but it's also being aware of possible impact of what you said and also kind of taking a little bit of responsibility for impact Mm -hmm. um, and at least understanding that you do have an influence there. And then additionally, understanding that this particular moment in the present is just part of an ongoing journey instead of an immediate threat to the self and the existence. And so what I take this to mean is this idea of you know, again, if we're going to bring it into the context of online arguments mm-hmm. that you're here and someone says something that really gets under your skin of understanding like, okay, this gets under my skin right now, but this is just one moment in like a much bigger context. It's not like I need to like rush to my defense, like it's freaking life or death right in this moment, which a lot of us do in these contexts. I know I certainly have that. It's immediately like, oh my God, how dare mm. they say that? You know, and I need to right. Like go. my whole identity is in exactly. crisis. Exactly. My whole identity is in crisis right now when maybe in reality, that's not necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, so kind of growth mindedness, also having a sense of like, things are growing, things are changing, things are moving. I'm learning, other people are learning and we're all kind of on this journey as it were. It, it's like, you know, the the previous two, the perspective taking and the detached awareness uh, and inclusive identity are kind of about seeing the bigger picture in terms of other people and other perspectives. And growth mindedness is, is like seeing the bigger picture over time. Mm-hmm. It's like realizing that this one specific moment right here isn't everything that's ever existed, that we're, it's all part of this longer journey and kind of looking at, like you said, like the the impact of your actions and what you're doing rather mm-hmm. than just your intent right then. So I feel like the whole quiet ego thing, it seems like what comes up again and again through these different facets is this idea of like, you have a part in this, but it's not all about you, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's kind of the big takeaway that I think I get, which I disagree. Right, right. Right. That you're connected to all of this, but you're also an individual. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just kind of having that in mind that this is not all about you, essentially. Mm. Mm. So before we get into more specific tools and some specific examples of this of these things at work in online discussions, we want to take a moment to talk about how you can help support our show and to keep this going. If this is something that you get value out of, we would appreciate it so much if you could give some value back to us by becoming one of our patrons at patreon.com slash multiamory. Uh, As a thank you for doing that, at the $5 a month level, we have a private invite-only discussion group online that you can join uh, that's closed to other people, so people won't see that you're in that group unless they're part of it. Um, This is actually a really great group for seeing a lot of these things at at work, um, that I've seen some really great examples of people really trying to become more aware of themselves and have more constructive and more healthy and caring discussions online. It's something we've really appreciated about this group. And like we said earlier, why we've thought about this topic so much. Uh, Also at the $7 a month level, you get our episodes a day early with bonus content and uh, no ads in them. So you don't have to hear us talking about all this every time. Uh, And then at the $9 a month level, we have a monthly video discussion group, um, which is another great way to have more of that face-to-face interaction with people um, through an online video call. So with all of those, if you want to support us, it really makes this possible. It allows us to do things like the tour, to keep growing, to add new features and more benefits for patrons. Like All of that is possible specifically because of your support at patreon.com slash multiamory. So another way that you can support us, you can go to multiamory.com slash store and buy some of our merch. So we have, you know, all kinds of things. We have mugs, we have t-shirts, we have lounge pants, we have notebooks. The most important part is the fact that um, we have a lot of merch that just has our logo on it that does not say multi-amory on it at all. And we specifically wanted to have that as an option for people because we realized that not everybody wants to loudly and proudly have something that says multi-amory across their chest. That's maybe going to invite questions or side eyes. Um from people that they don't feel like responding to or explaining themselves to. Mm-hmm. So that's why you can buy a uh, multi-amory merch with just the logo. It's going to be your secret bat signal to other multi-amory fans who are going to know exactly what it is that you're talking about. You're going to find some new best friends out in the wild. Mm-hmm. But for people who don't know, it just kind of looks like, I don't know, it could be just like generic, ambiguously Celtic design that <laughs> just seems cool. Um, so you can talk it off pretty easily. So again, if you want to do that, help support the show, go to multiamory.com slash store. 
If you don't want to support our show with money, <laughs> that <laughs> also is okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, you can do it in a different way by going to iTunes or Stitcher and writing us a review, um, which would be lovely because it helps us appear higher in search results and things like relationships or non-monogamy or polyamory, stuff like that. If people are searching for podcasts that have those things uh, in common or in, you know, out there and they're like, where do I go? Then (laughs) you will help us and we will show up higher in search results by giving us a review. Plus, we love reading them. It really, like, affirms that we are doing something great for uh, the community and um, hopefully helping some of you out there, you know, like the four of you who, like, get help by this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All Jeez, of you, we Emily. appreciate it. Emily, so self-deprecating <laughs> today. Oh, no, gosh. I'm sorry. That's, you're, that's you're, my bad thing. Quiet. That's why it's I don't quiet, get an in inner... <laughs> I don't internet get conflicts. online in internet, like trolling events because events <laughs> like it's an established event i think you mean flame because wars because i'm self-deprecating yes <laughs> um Gosh. yeah so go to stitcher or itunes and write us a review we would really appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> okay um well if you don't want to participate in any of that i guess you can also support us uh, by checking out our sponsor. So our sponsor for this week's episode is Audible. Audible is a huge online library of audiobooks, um, audiobooks and and lectures and mm-hmm. the all, online courses are great. Yeah, fantastic online courses. Um, so basically, what you do if you sign up for the trial, you get the service free for thirty days. They'll also give you a credit for a free audiobook, um, and then you can cancel it or you can decide to keep going with the subscription. I have Jace has. Um, Recently, I've been listening to, there's um, a couple of different compilations of Alan Watts lectures. So again, not even really an audiobook, just like a series of recorded lectures that are just mm-hmm. freaking fantastic. So I definitely recommend that. So if you want to check that out, and if you also want to support our show at the same time, you can go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. Yeah. And they will support our show, whether you keep your subscription or not, just mm-hmm. for doing the trial. So mm-hmm. if you haven't done it before, go check it out. Get a free audiobook. I really enjoyed it. Okay, so let's get back into it. So let's say, so we've talked about the whole quiet ego thing, you know, some things to think about, some things to work on in yourself, you know, and and I think, again, the quiet ego thing also very applicable to in-person arguments or conflict as Mm -hmm. well. But let's say here you are, you're online, you're in your Facebook group or your forum or on Twitter or whatever, and something's happened where you're about to get into the thick of it. Maybe you posted something and somebody posted back saying like, well, I don't really agree with this. Like I actually take umbrage with this or, Uh you know, or you see something that somebody else posts and you're like, oh gosh, like actually that really makes me uncomfortable. I feel like I need to say something or maybe, you know, in a comments thread, someone's starting to disagree with you. So you're here basically, and you know that we're about to get into an internet argument. Mm -hmm. What are some actual like tools and approaches that you can have under your belt to make this less of a waste of time and energy for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one to start with, and this one I think is maybe the most difficult to put into practice until you've had practice with it, until you've really like spent some time exercising these muscles and getting better at this. But I think this one does lie at the core of a lot of this and is very much related to kind of checking your ego and seeing what your motivations are. And that is, to pause before any of these interactions and ask yourself the question, what is the real goal of this interaction? What is my real goal for Mm. this? And depending on your answer to this question, this can drastically change the way that you will approach this or whether you address it at all. Um, So in asking this question, again, uh, assuming we're not in a trolling situation where your goal is just to cause trouble, Um, then get out of here. Uh, But uh, so ask yourself this question and you may be honest with yourself and come back with the answer of like, my real motivation is I want to yell at someone. I want someone to feel bad for this thing they said. Mm -hmm. And if that's your motivation, really think about like, what's the impact that's going to have? Are you going to feel better after this? Scientifically, it's been shown you won't. Mm -hmm. Um, So really like, If that's the answer, take a moment and evaluate, is that really something that I, a choice that I want to make in my life? 
And you can have a variety of goals when you ask yourself that question. Like you may could be a little of each. Yeah, you may sit and think and realize, like, oh, actually, like I think I want to respond to this because I think it's going to make this community safer, or it'll make me feel safer if this person knows this particular thing, maybe about language or about what they've said.、Um, Uh, maybe your goal is to actually have a debate, and I mean like a debate as in like actually this seems like an interesting conversation, or actually I feel like I could stand to learn something from this, or maybe the other person could stand to learn something from this.、Um, you know, it is possible to have those as a goal too. But again, like it's really important to check yourself to make sure that is your deeper motivation, not just kind of like the more noble thing that you're kind of hiding behind. Well, and and I think that's it, though, is that based on your answer to this question, it will change it. So to use those two as an example, right? If your goal is to make this community safer for yourself or others, that response that you would write might be very different from someone who wants to be argumentative and just yell at someone. That's true. And if you're、yeah. unclear about what your goal is, or maybe your goal was both of those, I want to yell at this person and I want to make this community safer. If you stop and go, okay, yelling at someone. Maybe not actually a good thing to do, so I'm not going to do that. So, if the goal that's left is to make my community safer, how can I approach this in a way that is achieving that goal,、mm-hmm. right? That's actually achieving that, and that might even be something that's getting someone else involved, like talking to a moderator. That might not even be having this argument right here in the forum. It could、right. be, but it could not be. But it might not be an argument. It might be instead more informative. But it can really change it depending what your goal is. Or if it's to have an actual debate, again, you're going to approach it differently. You're going to want to be sure you're not being combative in the way you talk and expressing your genuine interest in wanting to learn and not just to try to prove a point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which, which is actually the next moves one. Moves on、yeah. to the next <laughs> one, which is: Are you just trying to prove a point?、Uh, um, so yeah, I mean, are do you see something that someone said and you're like, no, no, that's not okay, or that's wrong, or something, and you just want to prove? That that person is incorrect. Like,、mm-hmm. is that really a good thing? Do you really need to do that right now? Is that actually going to do anything like helpful or or kind or good? Like in this moment, really like check yourself on that、um, as well. And are you are you doing it just out of ego? Because probably if you're just trying to prove a point, that's just kind of an egotistical way to be. And you know, you might be having. A little ego moment there, and it's probably not going to like be doing a good thing for the community. Sometimes it's so hard to tease all these things out because I think, like、sure. Jay like said, said, like it takes practice. It, can, it、yeah. takes practice, and it can be a little bit of each. You know, like there can be a part of you that feels like, well, actually, I feel like I do kind of care what this person says because I I hope that they don't continue to use that. Let's say that particular language or that particular label, like because I do care about them being taken seriously. But then maybe there's a part of me that's like, oh, but I was kind of stung by them using that label, so I feel kind of hurt, and so I also want them to know how I was hurt,、um, you know. But I also want to be able to kind of prove that they're wrong and I'm right, you know. That like it can be a number of different motivations that can kind of well up within us.、Mm-hmm. Well, and that's why I think kind of what. What Emily's starting to get at with these points too, and what we were talking about earlier, is say you have a few of them that are your reasons, that then you can look at them and decide, okay, which of these goals do I want to actually pursue?、Mm-hmm. Yeah,、right? you can start teasing that out a bit and decide, like, okay, do I really need to add in the section where I'm like, oh, and I'm proving <laughs> a point here、yeah. with your language or with the tone in which. You're responding to this other person、mm-hmm. because I think again there are more diplomatic kind ways of presenting an argument or doing a teachable moment there instead of just being like oh and you're a dick and you're wrong、mm. fuck、right. you yeah yeah、um, and also you have to ask yourself are you just showing off are you being performative in this moment like、mm-hmm. are you doing this so that people in this particular group like. Cheer you on for beating someone up, because I think、yeah. we see、yeah. that a lot, and then it kind of gets into this like sort of mindset, like pack mentality thing. Like, oh, it's all of us against this one person, and you're kind of the instigator of that. Like, that's not cool. Well, I think the whole performative thing is really interesting because, of course, like by nature. Most of our discussions we have online have a performative aspect to it because of the fact that we're aware everyone else is watching,、mm-hmm. and that can be both a good and a bad thing. It can be good in that it's like you know you know people can stand to gain by seeing 
how a particular debate or conversation plays out. Like people can stand to Mm -hmm. gain some knowledge or some education or some awareness by seeing how someone else's conversation goes out. However, it can also, I think sometimes I, what I see online is sometimes it can be very hollow. It can kind of be like, well, I don't take any actual action about this particular issue in my normal life, but I can perform the action of like, going and attacking someone who disagrees with me or going and attacking someone who maybe doesn't quite fit into this community or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that looks like I've taken action to a certain regard. Um, This is Mm -hmm. also like a much deeper topic that I feel like, you know, we could get into much more in depth, but. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's like we're talking about if your goal is to make your community safer, but then if you're honest with yourself and you also realize there's this goal to kind of show off the fact that I'm such a defender of other people in this group, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that can lead you to be a lot meaner and more cruel to this person, which isn't going to change their mind, is not going to actually make the community a better place, except maybe making that person leave. But then you haven't made the world a better place. You haven't helped anyone learn anything because your goal was just for everyone else to be like, yeah, man, yeah, as you're telling this person what an asshole they are. I mean, that takes a lot of like self-understanding to be like, hey, what is my true motivation here? And I've seen this done by moderators of groups. Mm -hmm. We've I've Mm -hmm. in several groups where someone will say something not out of ill intention, but just something that is a little bit offensive or belittles someone else unintentionally. And the response, rather than being, hey, let's help you understand why you like why that thing was upsetting so that you can learn and become a better member of this community. It's fuck you, asshole. You're so privileged. You're whatever, whatever, whatever. Calling names, Mm -hmm. right? Jumping to that, even to the point of after the person's left the group, people being like, yeah, fuck that guy. Hated that guy. Fuck Mm -hmm. that guy. I'm glad you told him what for. Mm -hmm. That it it makes you feel good. And so you think you did a good thing Mm -hmm. when in reality, the world wasn't made a better place by that action. And if they were honest with themselves about what their goal was, that might've been an uncomfortable realization to go, oh, my goal was for the people to cheer me on for telling this guy what a shithead he is. Well, I feel like, I mean, that's definitely something that if you also ask yourself the question, like, am I still motivated enough to like have this discussion with this person in a private capacity, you know, quote unquote, calling someone in as opposed to out, like Mm. choosing to be like, okay, let's talk about this in private messages. And if your motivation mm. really drastically drops, then I think that's kind of a signal of like, oh, there's a part of this of that of like knowing mm. that other people are going to see this that is motivating me right now. Yeah, and just to be yeah. just to be aware of that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then on the flip side of that is to ask the question: um, Is am I making a point or entering into a discussion about something that isn't actually related to the original post? So. Uh, to give a concrete example of this, I think helps to understand it. So this is something that I've seen variations of this happen many times. But so here's the example. Someone posts in a group about um, some online dating profiles that they've seen. And they're saying, gosh, like I'm so sick and tired of, of feeling like everyone on their dating profile says, I want someone who's fit, athletic, and attractive. When I myself am an overweight person, like that really sucks feeling like no one wants me and that just because of who I am, I, no one loves me, right? Something to that effect. And then someone comes along and misinterprets the purpose of this post or the goal of this post and says, well, it seems like it's okay that someone could express their preference, right? Like that's what dating profiles are good for, right? That you can state your preferences. And I've seen this happen in various contexts, right? Not just about being overweight, but about mm-hmm. race or about um, mental health or about you know any number of other things. And essentially what's happened here is that this person came along thinking that this was a post asking to debate about whether it's objectively okay to state your preferences in a dating profile. And that's the conversation that they think is being had mm-hmm. and that's the one they're trying to have here. But they get a very negative reaction to it because what was actually being talked about was how it it hurt for this person's personal experience to feel like they're written off from the get-go just because of a quality of who they are Mm -hmm. as a person. And their hurt feels, you know, belittled and just tossed aside by this person saying like, well, it's, but it's okay for someone to state their preferences. Right. And the thing about this that's so frustrating is that 
the person who then feels really hurt and marginalized by this feels attacked. And so often the reaction is to react aggressively to that. And then other people jump in performatively to be like, you're an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like you're so privileged, whatever, you know, you're thin privileged or whatever Mm -hmm. is related to that. And then that person goes away saying, I thought I was making a pretty reasonable statement and everyone jumped all over me. Mm -hmm. And it's because Mm -hmm. you were trying to talk about a point that wasn't actually related to what the person was talking about and didn't even realize it. And that, like I said, with all these, it's exercising those muscles of like, how do I get a better understanding of this? And I think one trick is if you get a reaction that surprises you, that's a cue to take a moment and consider perhaps I missed something. Perhaps I misread something here or I misinterpreted. How is it that like, cause I, you know, if I posted a pretty reasonable thing, I would expect a reasonable response. And if I get an angry response back, it's like, okay, I missed something. So rather than try to defend myself or explain myself, I'll say, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't realize, you know, thank you for pointing that out. Something that's very much not saying like, sorry, but, Mm. but just saying, Mm. I'm so sorry. And then take a moment to think about it and try to figure out what happened. Cause that's actually going to grow you as a person and hopefully will help that community more uh, rather than just trying to defend yourself or leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like a Triforce thing almost. That's like it's related, yeah. They were yeah, I mean like they were asking for number two just for some empathy, but then instead they got a little bit of three, like somebody telling them like, Well, it's okay or you should do this or something along those lines. Well again, it's that which it's is that also same, kind of switch tracking and it's yeah. just yeah. a so bunch a of shit of that we've things. talked about. It's also the same thing of of kind of like trying to bring logic to kind of cancel out emotion, you know, kind of be like, well, you know, cause I think the message that gets picked up from that is like, well, you shouldn't be emotional or hurt because logically maybe there's a basis for this thing right. to be okay. You know, which is like, there's another time to have that logical philosophical debate about right. this is about uh, someone's, but feelings. this is about someone's feelings and like yeah. lived experience. Yeah. 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 So the next thing you can do is take a lap or <laughs> a few hours or a day or something Uh, Just just kind of halt in this moment and ask yourself, like, okay, maybe I don't need to respond right now when I'm emotional and when I'm looking at this. Am I hungry, angry, lonely or tired? And is it causing me to potentially want to say something or do something that maybe I shouldn't do? So it can also be like a really good time to go do your own research on the topic that is Mm. being discussed. Um, So like read a bunch of opinions, read some news articles. Uh, and ta- not just like, ones look that support count- your view, right? No, right. exactly. Talk about, like, look at the counter arguments to the argument that you want to make. So, yeah, I mean, there may be, like, really good facts out there about the thing that somebody else is arguing for. And do your freaking homework. Look at Look at those arguments as well as your own. Yeah, yes, I, I think in practical terms... You know, like just to give out an example, like maybe where I've seen this before is like maybe someone posts like, oh, I'm so frustrated when like men on dating sites do yada, yada, yada. Um. And inevitably there's like the first one in the gate is some kind of not all men kind of response. And it's like, like, okay, so you had that experience of like, oh, like this person said something about men and I identify as a man. And like, I don't think that I do that. And I'm kind of upset that they would say that. And it's like, instead of responding right away, like take some time take an hour, take a day. That's uh, like Emily was saying, that's good time to be like, Hey, maybe I should actually Google this phenomenon of Mm. what this person is experiencing on a dating site. And maybe that will also expose you to all the real common responses like the not all men response, you know, just like do Mm. that labor ahead of time so that you don't come in sounding like an idiot. Right. (laughs) Essentially. Like that's another thing is, is, you know, it's a good time to educate yourself instead of immediately hopping into a debate or immediately hopping into like demanding that this other person educate you and do that emotional labor, you know, things like that. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. And the next thing I, uh, well, in addition to all of that, after doing your research or after taking time, you may realize that you don't even need to discuss this or you don't need to participate in this big old argument. I think that's so powerful. Yeah. I mean, really, honestly, like, 
again, in the moment when you are upset about something or when something kind of like sets you off, that is the worst time to probably start talking about something. Like in a regular argument, it may be the worst time to say like immediately what's on your mind mm. and just potentially say something that you might regret. Um, the same holds true here. It's it's exactly the same kind of tactic that you might use. So, and uh, at the end of the day, maybe if you've taken that time, you realize like this is actually not a place that I want to go at this point. Yeah. Um, and then also, yes, just no. I was just saying, yeah, amen, <laughs> amen, yeah, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, if you've been called out on something, I. Uh, Take the time to consider that it was probably really difficult for the other person to bring this up um, and that they might be a little afraid of the reaction that you might have to being called out. So at least like take a moment to consider that. And again, as we said before, don't act on it in a particularly like emotional way. Try to like maybe take some time and be like, okay, what is really happening here? And that's another time in which to look inward. So yeah, I can't even tell you the number of times that like I see a comment or someone makes a post or someone sends an email and my initial reaction is like, oh, that really sets me off or no, I think they're Mm. wrong or Mm -hmm. no, that's ridiculous that that like that's the kind of feedback that I'd be getting. And if I take my time, I like seriously so many times that within 24 hours, my opinion has completely changed on what I would initially Mm. respond to because initially it's like defensiveness and wanting to kind of fight about it. And then it'll be like, well, maybe I should talk to Jace or Emily about it and be like, what do you think about this? Like, do you think this is ridiculous too? Or what do you think they should say? And then usually Emily and Jace have a totally different perspective. I'm like, okay, huh, take Mm -hmm. that into consideration. And they'll be like, I'm going to take this to Google and see what other people think about this topic. no. (laughs) And and see like a wide variety of opinions. And then I'll be like, oh, wow, actually I hadn't considered it from this perspective. Oh, that totally makes sense. And and then just time, just be like, okay, I'm just going to like kind of think about that or let that settle. And just so many times that, when I give myself that space that what I end up coming back to is like, Oh, you know, maybe actually that person was right. Or maybe that person was really valid. Or maybe my response is going to be just a lot more empathetic and a lot more respectful than it would be if I'd chosen to respond right in that moment where I was feeling the most defensive, essentially. I've also found that, that taking that, that moment, that little pause uh, can, can also help you to give a response that's better, but realize that you don't have to come to a final conclusion about this thing. Um, for example, there was something that that I said in a comment to something many months ago, and someone responded a little while later being like, hey, actually, what you said was a little bit ableist. Um, and my first reaction was to kind of explain like how in this context it wasn't or something like that to be defensive, essentially. Mm-hmm. But I was like, okay, no, not going to do that because I can tell I'm I'm feeling you know, reactive about this. And so instead Mm. walked away from it for a little bit and then decided to come back and just say like, thank you so much for, for calling me out on that and letting me know. And like, that was it. It kind of just stayed at that. I hadn't yet finished thinking about that, debating about that and actually spent many more months like thinking about that, trying to learn about that. Um, And it's still an ongoing process, but I think that too, it's, it's, it's okay to just say, you know, thank you for bringing that up and letting me know, especially since like Emily said, it can be challenging to be the one to say that and worry that someone is going to react badly to you when you call them out for something. Um, But just taking the moment to say thank you for it and not saying that means you have to have finished thinking about it and come to your conclusions already. Right. Right. It's still an ongoing process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and both of those things that you just said and what we're talking about here, I think, allows us to to humanize the person on the other end of the computer i guess <laughs> instead yeah. of just being like you are a shadow person or you're just a bunch of words on a screen and instead be like hey this person has their own experiences and therefore they may be thinking about this in a completely different way than i am and that is incredibly you know it's something that i need to think about and at least like this is another human being. So I'm not the only human. I'm not the only star of the show here. Like right. think about the other person in that moment. Right. Yeah. So let's say, you know, you've taken your time and maybe you have come back to the conversation. You know, you have decided like, no, I do want to participate in this. And I, uh, there is something that I want to say here or that I feel like needs to be said here. An important question to ask yourself also is, 
you know, if I have this argument, what do I stand to gain? And what does the other person stand to gain? Um, Hmm. And just to really consider like, literally, what is it that you would gain by continuing to kind of push this? And this is kind of related to our initial questions of like, what's really your goal here? What's really on the other side of this? Um, Because here's my thing is, I think that it, um, it's really easy for us to get sucked into arguing based on like the principle of something. So for instance, where I see this a lot and where I've definitely experienced this personally is when there's arguments about particular language that can or, or cannot be used. And I think that if someone's like, like for instance, let's say in your instance, Jace, if someone's mm-hmm. like, Jace, I think what you said was ableist. And it can be really easy for someone in Jace's position to take that as like, someone's trying to police my language. Someone's trying to tell me what Mm. I can and cannot say. Someone's trying to control me. And so I'm going to fight to regain my right to not be controlled. Um, Uh When it's like, in reality, that's not necessarily what you're kind of fighting for. Like, are you just fighting for the ability to keep using this particular ableist word? Like how much value does that have to you? Is it really that particularly difficult for you to just use another word like that's something that's really helped me just to have a sense of like what is it that i'm actually fighting for here what is it Mm -hmm. i'm actually trying to gain here um and is it possible for me to enter into this discussion in such a way that both of us could actually gain something Mm -hmm. i feel like pride is so caught up in it whenever someone answers that it's the principle of the thing what they're actually saying is i'm proud (laughs) that it is my pride i have to win regardless of what's actually better for me or for the other person or for the world. It's just about winning for the sake of winning. It's just about pride. And I think we can have that reaction. Like I said, I initially had a reaction to be somewhat defensive and, you know, instead did, did take that moment to check in and be like, okay, what, like that's, I can make a very small change in my life about either some language I use or about a type of comment I might use that doesn't doesn't significantly impact the quality of my life, but might be very positively impacting the quality of other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's like I would be fighting a fight to win so that more people can lose and I don't have to think as hard. Right. Right. And maybe I'll put more effort into fighting this fight than to actually just changing how I talk. Right. So that's, I think, a really good example of that. Um, Like, why? What do you you have to win here? What are you fighting for? Uh, Like Emily's thing, she always uh, says, this came from your mom, right? The like, is this the hill you want to die on? (laughs) Oh, yeah. The mountain. Is this the mountain you want to... What mountain do you want to die on? (laughs) Right. No, mom. Which one do you want to die on? (laughs) No. No. God. (laughs) <laughs> anyways oh man uh so the next one, next one the next one's about knowing when to stop so cornell university there, there was a study at cornell university that found the chances of a person changing the view of another person in an online argument falls dramatically after just five replies so essentially like the more into the weeds you get the less likely you are that anybody's going to change their mind and that's not a lot of back and forth yeah five no. replies is, is like pretty nothing. quick that's yeah. right <laughs> Um, and it, after that point, it tends to be a lot of repeating and rehashing, often not even really rewording things, but just kind of saying them again, often getting more and more aggressive too. Mm-hmm. Um, but just check to see if you can identify, is there like a core disagreement underneath all of this? Because maybe you're each bringing up all these details or like specific examples, but keep kind of arguing past each other. Perhaps there's a core disagreement somewhere more fundamentally, more earlier down the line that hasn't been addressed, that you just fundamentally see things through a different lens. Right, right. I think that some examples of this could be situations where, you know, maybe you get into a debate with some friend online about non-monogamous relationships, um, you know, and about which ones are successful and which ones are not and which ones are healthy and which ones are not. You know, maybe your friend is real pro, like, having a don't ask, don't tell relationship. And you're like, no, that's not ethical. Like, I don't like that. And so you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But maybe, you know, as you examine the conversation, maybe it becomes more apparent that like, there's kind of a deeper disagreement than that. Like there's a deeper sense of how the two of you view the world much differently. You know, maybe your friend is really pro don't ask, don't tell because the way they view the world is that, um, you know, talking to your partner about being attracted to someone else or sleeping with someone else is hurting them. 
and you don't want to hurt your partner. And maybe that's just like the different lenses that the two of you see the world through. And like, that's not the debate you're having. And that's also not your job in that moment to try to convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's maybe, I don't know if that's the best example, but like, I feel like that's something kind of close of being able to kind of, I think again, having the quiet ego, being able to detach a little bit, see the bigger picture and realize like, oh, like we just really literally see things differently. And so it's not going to be a productive argument to argue about the pros and cons of don't ask, don't tell when there's kind of a deeper disagreement here that this current conversation is not about. I found my, my access point to that sort of thing actually came in reading books. I remember this in my, my junior year high school English class is where this first kind of occurred to me was this idea that kind of realizing that conversations and thoughts that characters have in books all came from one person's mind hmm. and that that person might view the world and view people in a fundamentally different way from the way that I do. And hmm. for me, this really came up in trying to read um, books by Anne Rand <laughs> that I oh, <laughs> believe God. I've stated this before, not a fan. Um, <sighs> but the reason for that that I realized is that the way that she views how humans exist, how we think what is important for us, how we exist with other people in the world, like all of these very fundamental level perceptions about what people are, are very different from my own. And so in trying to, you know, read her characters and listen to them interact with each other. I was just like, I don't fucking understand. I, I hate all these people. They all seem terrible and their decisions don't make any sense. And when I realized that it's because, you know, her view of the world is just so fundamentally different from mine, that then it actually helped me to have sort of an appreciation for her books in the way that they show me a perspective that clearly a lot of people in the world share hmm. that I don't because she's an incredibly popular yeah. author um, that it, it helped me to see like, God, there's a lot of people in the world who see life very differently than I do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So even if I don't like her books or her values, I can at least appreciate the fact that she does give us a good gateway into seeing a world in a way that I don't. Right. Right. Yeah. And so that I think, it's really important to recognize that again, because of the fact that like, if we're always trying to convince each other, there does reach a point where like, where someone's not going to be convinced um, unless you dedicate like a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort. And they are also dedicating a lot of time and energy and effort to being open to being convinced or changing their worldviews that not necessarily, that can't necessarily be reached in 10 minutes on Reddit, essentially. <laughs> right. um, and by the way, like, just as a little bit of an aside, that Cornell University study is super fascinating. Like, mm. basically, they went to, there's a particular subreddit that is specifically designed for, like, I think it's like r slash civil discourse or something like that, where okay. it's supposed to be having debates in good faith. Right. Um, mm. Where people are supposed to be more open to like actually discussing things and maybe not so defensive and things like that. And they just did this like really nice in try. well, they did this really in depth study of how do people get convinced? What are the markers that mm. suggest that someone's more malleable? What is the language that someone uses if they are more malleable versus if they're oh. less malleable on this particular topic? Like how quickly does someone respond and how much does that have an impact on whether or not someone changes their mind? It's, and you can read the whole really study cool. for free yeah. online. So I definitely recommend doing a little Google there. Um, but it's just really, really interesting. But I think a core fundamental part of it is just knowing that like, to a certain extent, some people are not malleable on certain topics and, and arguing mm. about is not going to change that. In fact, it will make them <laughs> more firmly more. believe in their thing right. that you're trying to argue against. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so finally, we come to uh, carefully state the disagreement and then just, just, uh, just, you're done. <laughs> yeah. So as in kind of um, once you recognize that maybe we've hit this, like, you know, five reply. Yeah, point of no return. Point, yes, the point where we're just going to be rehashing the same stuff. So there's this really nice quote from journalist Pedro Burgos, um, which is that if you lose an argument, you win some knowledge. If you win an argument, then you gain an ally. If you end in a stalemate, which is by far the most likely result, then try to rephrase your opponent's argument in yours succinctly, 
in a single comment so that everyone has an opportunity to win some appreciation for the debate. So you need to acknowledge what you learned and show empathy in that moment. Uh, And this is, yeah, I really like what he said here. Because again, so many times these arguments just end in people like screaming obscenities at one another via the internet and then are never heard from again or blocked or, you know, get thrown out of a group or something. Well, I think it really calls into question changing our ideas of what it means to win or to lose an argument. Mm -hmm. Because again, he brings up this idea of like, if you approach it as in my quote unquote, losing this argument means that I learn something. Whether it's I yeah. learn about someone else's perspective or I learn about something I didn't consider before, or it's like I learn about which arguments to get into or to not get into, <laughs> you know, yeah. you losing the argument is winning some knowledge. Mm-hmm. And then winning is not like dominating the other person or making them hurt or punishing them in some way. It's somehow getting an ally. Like, can you argue in such a way yeah. that the winning scenario is we become allies. Right. And I think that's so fundamentally different from how online arguments are conducted almost all of the time. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. And so this seems like a good strategy for bowing out. If, you know, if it's a stalemate, again, you're kind of rehashing and just going in a circle of just being able to just succinctly say like, well, like we dis we fundamentally disagree on this. Um, and like, I learned this. Thank you for like sharing this. And, Secret out. <laughs> right. That it's that it's that <laughs> I think this is really interesting and I haven't done this one, but the idea of, of restating it, of trying mm-hmm. to say, you know, well, it seems like you you believe this thing and think this was true, and I believe this thing, this was true. You brought up some interesting points. I'm gonna look into those. Um, you know, thank you. It seems like this is where we're at. I feel like kind of leaving it there. That's I really I feel like the tricky thing though would be not trying to do parting shots with that, of yeah. trying to be like, well, clearly you believe that this ridiculous thing is true. And I believe Mm -hmm. that this very normal and rational thing is true. And I guess we're not going to see, you know, I think that's where the show empathy comes. Yeah. Showing the empathy. And again, checking the ego thing of, of really trying to not use that as like your parting shot on the Mm -hmm. way out essentially. Right. But then to just be done. Yeah. And to, even if they continue to try to engage on this, that that's, that is the end of it. Because Mm -hmm. like we said, science has shown you're not going to convince anyone at this point. So you're probably going to be happier going about your day at that point anyway. And healthier, lower blood pressure. Yeah. 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 Can I use some of that? All right. Well, now this is your call to action to go out into the world and make the internet a little bit better place. Yeah. Just a little bit better if you can. Yeah. Cause God, it needs it. Yeah. (laughs) The internet can be a shitty place sometimes. Right. And we're hoping that we can help work together and make it a little bit better. Yeah, Definitely. for sure. If you want to get in touch with us, send an email to info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can also leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-05 or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. To support our show and join our private Facebook community, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Life on the Swing Set is heading to paradise for the seventh time, and once again, we're taking over Desire Resort, Riviera Maya, in Cancun, Mexico. With this year's hosts, me, Cooper, Ginger, Dylan, JV and Shara from Ending the Sexual Dark Age, and author, podcaster, and feminist porn filmmaker Tristan Taramino, our takeover allows us to mold the resort in our geeky, sexy, and inclusive image with orgies, classes about pegging, flogging, and fisting, theme nights, a full dungeon night, naked karaoke, mutual masturbation, and massages. From November 3rd through the 10th, 2018, this beautiful, all-inclusive resort will be full of sexy swing setters from every letter in the LGBTQA spectrum. Holly, swingers, nudists, kinksters, doms, subs, and those who are just curious about what a week at a sexy resort offers. We take all the best of the swing set. 
our values, our experience, our co-hosts, our community, and we bring it all together with the best resort staff on Earth to create a queer, kink, and poly-friendly, consent-aware, and sexy-as-hell experience for everyone who joins us. To come with us on our Swing Set Takes Desire 2018 trip and hear us podcast about our previous trips, head over to ssdesire.com. We'll be there to welcome you home.